Our guest on Expat Hoops today is Carvel Anderson. The Robert Morris alum has a career overseas that spans countries like Italy, Germany, France, Spain, and Turkey to date. But before we get to the interview, just a reminder to help support the pod by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Those are some of the free, easy things you can do to help us. You can also find all of our content on expathoops.com, as well as merchandise so you can wear our logo with pride. And for our audio listeners, you can find exclusive extra content on YouTube. Literally, we call them expat extras. But for now, want to get to the pod. So welcome to the pod, Carvel. Appreciate it, man. You guys are official. You got a whole intro and everything. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we try. We try. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's sort of one of the little bare minimum things. Hopefully we can clear that hurdle. But uh, uh, we're happy to have you on. We actually have been talking for a little while. We're sitting down in the summer of 2022. So we're going to go over your career a little bit and ask kind of what's next for you. Um, but it. Before we kind of get into that, you've got a really interesting story. Uh, we'll probably link it up somewhere, but uh, mm -hmm. there's a really good ESPN article uh, that I'm going to distill down to like the very bare bones. It's worth checking out. Uh, the very short of it is you faced quite a bit of adversity growing up, homeless for a stretch, behind in high, high school and academically at the start, mm -hmm. make your way to three junior colleges before landing at Robert Morris. I mean, even the details of getting like physically getting to Robert Morris. I think there were a couple car breakdowns, you know, a couple uh, tires going flat. I, I mean, looking back on it now, hopefully it's almost a little comical to look back and of course you've got the worst luck, but yeah. there is going to be a question here at the end of this. And again, check out okay. the article. However, you got to uh, Robert Morris shined as a player. This is all a really long question to, when did you actually think you could play professionally, like tangibly, not just a dream that I'm sure probably kept you going through all this, but you're having a lot of success in college. You're finally, you know, mm -hmm. each step of the way, I'm sure in junior college, you were getting attention, your, your, your points per game and all your stats were great. You know, you keep going and you're finally division one. It's, it's continuing. I'm sure there's probably a point that your coaches or somebody came to you and said, look, you can make this your career. When, when, when was that? And what did that look like to you in terms of somebody coming to you and saying, look, you know, you should talk with an agent or what did, what did that process look like for you? Uh, and, and I'll be honest, man. And I don't even mean to, <clears throat> to go back to the beginning area. Please do. You've mindset, got a, you've got yeah. the story to tell, not me. No, so no, if you've no. got somewhere else to go, go there. Um, but that mindset actually came from back in that period because uh, with a lot of stuff I was dealing with, I've always just had like a, a passion for basketball you know I have uh, my family we good and bad we have like very addictive personalities you know what I mean and mine just happens to be the game of basketball and for some reason I've always just loved it and lived it like I really live it um so I've always had that mindset and then I developed a skill set in high school with the coach I had um I couldn't shoot at all <clears throat> until I became a sophomore in high school and he just really drilled he was a kind of ahead of his time um, with where the game was. You know what I mean? It was um, – my idol was Allen Iverson. So, at this time, I'm head down. I have braids, cornrows, everything. I'm rocking number three. I'm just trying to get to the rim. And he kind of, um, you know, just kind of changed my my basketball mindset. Um, he was a 50-year-old man who was third all-time leader in the state of Indiana scoring. Um, and he would every morning still go to the gym and make a thousand shots at 530 before school starts. Um, and in America, to be a high school coach, you have to uh, be a teacher. A lot of times they just coach uh, like the, the PE classes, the physical education classes, you know. Um, and he just got me to I was there every day with him, you know, and then for the last the last rest of my my career in high school every day for two and a half years at five thirty in the morning, I'm making a thousand shots. Um, and I was seeing it translate to the basketball court. I was from the small town I'm from, I was playing a, a, a style that wasn't really accepted yet with shooting, very hard nose, go to the basket. Like I said, get fouled, be, be tough, be a man. Um, but I was getting a lot of attention for it from the small areas around us, including these JUCOs. Um, and a little bit of a dream, yes, but that was all I knew was basketball, you know, good or bad. So um, I never had any other, for me, there was no ever any thought that I was never going to be a professional basketball player. 
you know what I mean? Um, uh, I would have loved to be an NBA player, but I never uh, locked myself into that mindset. My goal was always to, to get paid to play the game of basketball, to live my life through it. Um, so that mindset, uh, to end a long story, has always been there from me. And then going through certain colleges, a couple, you know, hit or miss situations, and then finally getting to Robert Morris, um, finally getting to Robert Morris. Um, you know, I just had a coach and I had a, a team, honestly, that we don't really breed pros, um, especially at that time. Now, social media with the way the world is, everybody is trying to breed a pro and you can get a pro from anywhere. But a school like Robert Morris, um, I think if I, uh, please guys, Robert Morris fans, if you listen and forgive me, there's a guy, we had one professional uh, NBA player um, and this was when Robert Morris was still a junior college. Um, so they have never had a, a, a NBA player from there. So it's not really a thought. It's just more just playing basketball, getting better, getting better. Um, and then end of my, se my senior year, uh, I get hot. I'm going crazy. We're winning. Um, and get a couple opportunities to get some tryouts in the NBA. And, um, but for me, there was never, I don't know, I, I can't remember one time that I ever thought that I was not going to be a professional basketball player. It's just, um, that's all I knew. And because of the things you, you, uh, you know, briefed about in that article, um, it was what saved me. It's the only thing that kept me going every single day. Um, so, yeah. And so I guess kind of the thing is, is, you know, a lot of the times with people, and this is the inartful way of asking this question, we've got to still figure out a better way of asking it. Because a lot of people always, you know, there's the desire there. But when was it for you that you were like, all right, I could do this? Or did somebody come to you and say, look, the, we're good, you're going to do this now, or that, you know, this is definitely possible for you that you can go overseas or, you know, the NBA tryouts at that point had an agent approached you and kind of yeah. basically getting you from the desire that I don't want to say everybody has, but virtually everybody that plays has mm -hmm. to, uh, okay, you're actually doing this. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, you know, kind of going through my, my senior year, probably midway through when I'm kind of, um, you know, I kind of get hot for a stretch. Now there's agents. I hadn't even thought about an agent. Um, I'm just playing the game. You know what I mean? Just doing what I do. And there's agents now reaching out to you. Um, then they maybe through Facebook or through certain type of ways, they would just reach out to you. And they're not really um, not to be disrespectful. They're not. Um, they're kind of look like, OK, maybe this is a real agent. Maybe it's not. Maybe this, you know, kind of pages that will hit you up but I'm like okay my name is traveling um and you know my game was I was I was kind of hitting like I said a stride my name was going places and then those workouts meant like okay um you know if I become an NBA player you know thank you thank you God that's that's not the end of the life the world for me but being invited to those were like okay this is actual possibility for me to start to to play professional the fact that my name was in these rooms, okay, that's more fuel for me. And then I, um, my college coach put me uh, in touch with an agent. Um, first agent, it was a uh, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Jeremy Chappelle. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He plays in Italy. Um, he's another Robert Morris alumni. And quick side note, because this is big for Robert Morris, um, this year in the Italian first division will be three Robert Morris alumni playing professionally in the same league. Three is a is a real number for us. You know what I mean? Uh, we're not a Duke of Kentucky, but again, he put me in with uh, in touch with a, an agent. We didn't really vibe, but I, I, the, what he saw for me, he was had a plan for me. And I'm like, okay, this is a real thing. Now it's about finding somebody I can work with because as you know, with guys you talk to, as any af professional athletes listening, that the agent, especially your first one, is so important. Um, you know, some guys never get a career off the ground, no matter the talent, but because they have a guy work or uh, an inv individual working for them who's not, you know, selling them how they should be. <clears throat> so I took that that process very serious. And I, I got a guy, Zach Schreiber, and, um, you know, we started from there and it was good. And I actually got a, a chance to go play um, in Italy my first year. I'm a very manifestive person. 
you know, I've always said I wanted to go to Italy and the first place I got to go play was there. So, um, you know, that's just kind of how it started in the senior year was, was when it got going. So actually that takes us to a great spot because that's literally my next question with Italy. So uh, when you're talking about different countries across the world, uh, Italy and France especially are two countries that when somebody who's not familiar with overseas basketball, when they might hear second division in either, either one of those countries, first of all, mm. it almost really doesn't matter uh, right. because the talent is so high at both of those, whether it's first division or second division, but you wind up going to second division Italy and first two seasons are there. Was it mm. one year deal or did you happen to get a two year deal to start, which are very rare, of course, man, I had a, it was to answer your question, it was one, two separate one year deals. Um, my first year, I didn't play. Uh, I didn't play particularly. I played. I played well. I wasn't, you know, in the second division as the American guard. You're supposed to be a, a, a big score. I averaged like maybe 13. I had an injury, and it just was a tough year for me. The adjustment, being a rookie, um, dealing with learning that okay, now this is a business. I'm realizing now it's a business. Um, and, and actually, and this I, is a, this is a know, really well, great point to stop on. Actually, what were yeah. some of those? Because again, going back to your history, you've you've dealt with a lot. You've bounced around. You yeah. like you said, we've been to th- you know three different junior colleges. You know, you went to Robert Morris. So these are different spots that are away from home. You're kind of yeah. accustomed to doing that. But this is your first time overseas, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's my first time. My definitely my first time over there. So it was all. Uh, uh, there's a culture shock you deal with. I'd be totally honest. Some guys, maybe some uh, people, maybe they don't. I did. Um, and like you said, I've been, I, I move around a lot. That's not foreign to me. Um, but, you know, when you, you, you know, just my first, my very, very first experience. And again, I apologize, Emil, I, they are in my hearts forever because they are the only people who gave me the opportunity. But you get off the plane and now I have a, a manual car with a guy who speaks no English. Um, I've never driven a manual at this point in my life. Um, on the piece of paper, there's my address to my home, the address to the gym, there's keys to my car. And he points at the time telling me the practice is at 10 o'clock and he leaves. I'm in this parking lot, you know, with this car that I have no idea how to control. <laughs> I have no idea where I am. What are, what are these people saying? I don't know. Like, and I'm trying to drive and I'm just destroying this poor car. And you just, you see everybody, you know, Italy, they're honking their horns and they're just giving me everything. And um, it was just like a, a, a wake up moment for me. You know, you're fresh off an eight hour flight, you're jet lagged for the first time. And then it's just like, here you go, world. Um, and just from up, then, this sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Um, but it, it shapes you though. It shapes you. It, you really, uh, because you go through that. And then the next day you have to do it again and again and again. And then uh, you get to a point where it kind of becomes home for you. And with your first team in, in your first year, uh, what did you have any other Americans or anybody else that you're able to, essentially, how much were you on your own and how did, mm. how did, how did the process come along with you feeling a little bit more comfortable? Because again, you, we mm. talked about it just a moment ago, you wound up staying there another year. I mean, re-signing yeah. with them. Mm-hmm. I, um, I had my first American was great a guy named Jesse Perry from uh, Arizona. It was a, it was a fun guy. He, uh, he was one of those people with that kind of, takes your mind off of stuff you with him you laugh and so it was good to have <clears throat> he was a veteran 29 you know I think he had been playing at a bunch of low leagues but um somebody I leaned on um and I had a couple of Italians honestly my coach was very warm he was a um I always tell people when I talk about him it's funny he's a, a Phil Jackson fanatic like as a coach he's like like if you think of Kobe Bryant to Michael Jordan Mimics his game, his walk, his swag, his apparel. That was my coach with Phil Jackson. He liked everything. We ran the triangle in the second division of Italy. We ran the triangle. That was the only play we had was the triangle. Um, the way we practice, you know, we would have, um, you know, a lot of guys, you have morning practices shooting and lifting or whatever. And, you know, we would have meditation sessions. We'd turn the lights off in the gym and we'd sit there with our eyes closed for 45 minutes. You know what I mean? And he was just like a 
So he kind of, he would talk to you. He would kill you on the court, but off the court, he would, you know, he would converse with you. How's your family doing? I'm not sure if he actually cared, but he did make that effort. Um, and it made me feel um, definitely at home. And he would give us books um, that kind of kept me occupied as well. He would give us the, the 11 ring Phil Jackson book. Um, he would give us, you know, these things. And he kind of created a, a small culture just for those two years that, um, you know, was perfect for what I needed. So number one, that's fascinating. I mean, like you're literally yeah. talking about an Italian Phil Jackson clone. Yeah. I mean, no, like, excuse me. Let me say, let me say this. Excuse me. He literally, this is no joke. He, people pray to whoever they pray to. I pray to God. People who are pray to wherever the power he prays to Phil Jackson. Like he, like he would marry this guy if he could and not in, in a way that he just is really inspired by him. He's moved by him in the way he is towards other people. You know, and so that kind of was, yeah, I don't know, just wanted to give him some love because he definitely deserved it. So that's kind of interesting that you're talking not only about the coach, but uh, about some of the Italian players that were on your team. What what was the reaction like uh, in terms of the fan base and in, in, in town uh, once you get past learning how to work a stick shift yeah. and, and the traffic jams that you were causing? What was it like yeah. playing for the team uh, and the reception that you uh, would get overseas versus like, let's say, in college? Um, it, it honestly was like kind of being in, in, in college. Um, I'm a mid-major guy. Um, the small towns, mid-majors, it's not the Dukes, you know, it's small towns. I'm in Moon Township, Pennsylvania. So it's a, it's a community there. Um, and that's how that town was for me. Imola in Italy is a very, very small town, but it's so small that those people, the, the people there, they work and they, they wait for Sunday to come to our games. So it's a small mid-major type gym. I don't know if it fits 1,500 people, maybe 2,000 maybe, but it's packed and it's hot. And the fans are there. There's a guy, my favorite guy, he always he come in, big, strong guy, Italian guy with his shirt off and he, he does the flags, swinging the flags. And he's there before we start warming up, swinging the flags over the thing. And he's there until after the game is over with. Um, and there's a whole, the whole gym is like that. Um, and it's just like they live it. So because it's a small town like that, when you would go outside, you would go to the market, you would do things like this. You would receive a lot of, hey, Carvel, great game. Uh, you know, uh, don't worry about your meal today. We, we'll take care of your meal. You know, it's a lot of that type of stuff. So it was kind of that same. It wasn't the best place in the world. I, I won't lie to you, but Imola was the perfect place for me individually, personally, um, because of the community. It allowed me, and then the second year was even better because now I'm comfortable. Now I know what I'm coming back to. They know me, you know what I mean? And now I have something to prove. Um, so it was just the, the perfect situation for me. And so that actually is a really good point to get back to. I, I, sorry, thank you for going along with the detour that I took you on, but you're talking about, you know, year one, you struggled a little bit, year two, you're now comfortable. You, you get into mm -hmm. that season. You, again, your numbers go up. Like you said, you averaged about 13.1 the first season. Uh, get up closer to, I think, about 18, almost 18 points a game. Mm -hmm. Numbers look a lot better across the board. Have a really good season the second year. Mm -hmm. So what was it like the second year playing um, in Italy before you start to move on to your next stop? Um, it was perfect because going into the summer, um, this was another thing that for me, the literally the only off real offer I had after my first year was to go back to them, which is why I returned. Um, you know, they wanted me, but they were like, you know, okay, you know, we know you, so we'll, you will take it. But I literally had no other option, <clears throat> but now I know the system, the same coach. I know the triangle. Now you have to understand, um, to the first year I, we played only the triangle NBA guys struggle playing the triangle mentally. It's a tough system to learn. Um, so you spend a lot of time thinking while you're playing instead of being instinctive. Second year. Now I know it. I practice it myself in the summer. I'm prepared for it. I arrive a little earlier. Uh, the team, some of the Italians and myself, we're, we're doing workouts, going through the triangle and all that type of stuff. So now, you know, uh, it's, it's something that's natural to me. Um, I don't have to think, okay, wait, because it's all read and react to triangle. It's a very uh, difficult um, offense, but very simple. But because of how comfortable I was, it allowed me to have a more successful season. Um, 
And again, I had something to prove. Um, I worked best under pressure. And, uh, you know, I, it was a great year for me. Um, we had a bunch of Italians. We brought some veteran guys that, that, that really nurtured me. And, you know, I love to this day. Um, so it was, it was, like I said, again, to repeat, it was the perfect place for me both the years. It gave me exactly what I needed. And it kept me hungry and humble at the same time. So really good experience, ultimately, in Italy over those two seasons. And uh, we talked a little bit off the pod. Uh, and talking about your career trajectory, you're going to wind up going to Germany ultimately in the next season. But yes. uh, in the summer, uh, before you're actually going to be making the call, you know, you, you have a, an experience with, uh, you know, with an Israeli club. Uh, and so mm-hmm. we're going to let you get into that, what the uh, timeline was like there with uh, what happened in Israel, why it didn't work out mm-hmm. and how you <clears throat> wound up going to Germany and, and, and dealing basically with that. Uh, overseas adversity, which is, again, not uncommon, but it happens. And this is certainly something that you'd never faced before in your career. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, you know, in college, you don't really, a lot of times, especially then you don't transfer schools too much. You don't get traded, you know, so not being on a team for a complete season is something you never really um, think about until you're a professional. And one of my personal goals always every single year and like my goal, okay, for my career, I want this. One of my main goals is to to always finish a season where I started, um, regardless. Um, that's just something I, I try to take pride in. And <clears throat> that season was tough for me. I got, okay, I was making a little more money. It's a big, big club, a big league. It's a first league now. Um, so I was excited going into there. And it was unfortunate. Um, and that was actually – um, to give them some love before the negative. I, I tell my, my current agent to this day, before I retire, I want to spend one more year in Israel. It's the, my favorite place I've been in my career in terms of having fun on the basketball court, having fun outside. The guy is very, um, they call it like a little small America over there. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so, you know, we're out there and I'm playing well. I'm a hardworking guy and our point guard goes down after like three weeks of the preseason um, and they moved me to the point guard. I'm, I just come from averaging 18, like I'm scoring. I had a, uh, almost a 50 point game in, in Italy that season before, like I'm in a, a score mindset um, and I'm getting there. So, like, okay, now you have to play the, two, the point guard. You have to be our only point guard um, for all of the preseason because we don't have our point guard. He, he got hurt. Like I said, um, and I was just honestly, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, I had been a, a scorer only all of my life. Um, and I just wasn't prepared to, I, I pride myself on being an underrated passer. So it is a flaw of myself, but I, I've never, at that time, I wasn't able to control a team, to run a team, especially at that level. I'd never played at that level. Um, and I struggled. I struggled being a point guard. I wasn't myself. Um, I wasn't aggressive like I normally am. So I didn't look like, um, the Carvo they wanted, even though, being honest, they weren't, a, you know, giving me a chance to be the Carvo that they asked for. So they wanted to bring in another guy, um, which is understandable. Um, but over there we had, I don't remember the number, but say you can have four Americans. No, you got five Americans. We already had five. You bring in a sixth one. Now someone has to rotate. Now they're asking me to rotate games, play a game here, play, miss a game here, play a game. And I'm 24 at the time, maybe. I just went crazy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hot right now. I can't play one game off, one game off. Even if I play terrible, I need to be out there. You know what I mean? I can't sit and just back and forth with that. And we just finally had a, a, a mutual agreement to part ways. Um, we did that. It was very amicable. Nothing, uh, no bad blood about it. It just was kind of disappointing because the situation wasn't what we agreed upon. And it was a situation that I really felt like I could have flourished. Um, there were some really good people there. Um, but I went to uh, Bremerhaven in Germany, who was actually recruiting me in the summer. And I um, said no to to go to Israel. So thank God that uh, that coach didn't hold grudges. Yeah, uh, and it's it's actually kind of a interesting stop. So take us through uh, your your season in Germany, both on the court mm-hmm. and off the court. Um, 
off the court was was not good for me. Germany, at least where I was, um, was a very gray place. Very, very gray. There wasn't much sun. It was all, even when it was warm, it was cloudy and gray. You know what I mean? It was in, and we're in a very, very, as almost as north as you can go. So it was tough for me. We had a long commute from the homes, from the apartments to practice. It's like almost a 30 minute drive to and from every day. And a lot of times it's not like that. So it was tough. Um, I'm getting there late. So I'm adjusting to being around guys who have three, two months, three months together already or whatever it is. They have some type of relationship. They are cultivating some type of roles. And now you have this guy who's, a, I'm a scorer. So that's always tough um, uh, coming in. And then, you know, I have ego like everybody else and I'm coming off the bench. So I'm playing with something to prove every time. Um, and it just was, uh, I learned how to be a professional in that time. Um, I learned how to so go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I, and I was going to say, adding on to it, I mean, Germany, again, where you are is in the Bundesliga. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's Germany's top league. And typically, yeah. uh, from people that we've talked to before in the past have, have added, not only is it a top league and there's a lot of good talent there, but it's usually a physical, more physical league. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's another component of it that I was going to ask you that, the Italian league is, uh, is, I don't want to say less physical because that makes it sound like it's, it's not physical or anything like mm. that, but it's, right. it's a style difference too. So, I mean, you're, yeah. you're not only going to a different country that characteristically off the court is, is potentially going to be different from Israel and, and uh, Italy, yeah. but stylistically on the court, it's going to be differently too. Completely different. I mean, and that's something a lot of people don't, you know, non, uh, overseas athletes really don't don't think about is that's tough man it's you have to you always have to be yourself but you kind of have to adjust your game from country to country to kind of fit in with the style um now and germany was um i haven't played there in a while but at the time was a much slower paced league a lot of you know pounding in the bat into the basket you know big guys you know go like and for me that was tough you know, I, I like to play with space. I like to play with fluidity, you know what I mean? And um, so, but I, I did play well. I had a, some, some good players on my team and we uh, we had kind of a good chemistry on the court. And, um, you know, we we had some some pretty big wins that year. But like I said, it taught me how to be a pro. Because um, like I said, having to deal with the situation, um, having to come to a new team. Um, now I'm dealing with all that. I told you, I always want to finish where I'm at. Now I'm dealing with that within myself a failure um you know now i'm on a new team so i have to figure out how to how can i fit in here um now i'm coming off the bench okay how do i you know I, now i got to deal with this and not come in and be myself and not disrupt um and i'm not really happy off the court <laughs> you know what i mean so it was but i still have a job to do you know what i'm saying so that's why it like really helped me become a true professional over there and uh, you know i'm thankful for that and and the second thing on my career list is, um, you know, something my coach in college taught me was to leave every place better than how you found it. And a lot of times when that happens, they want you to come back. Um, so um, I've always had teams at least want to have discussions about me returning. Um, and that happened there in Germany, except for Israel, obviously. Um, so it was just helping me become a pro and I'm learning how to do things. Now we're having discussions about coming back um, and I'm going through that. It was, um, it was an interesting year for me, but it kind of, again, I'm a guy under, under pressure. Um, so now it's like, okay, now people in my mind, okay, this team basically in my mind, if they didn't cut me, uh, we agreed that it wasn't good for either one of us, but in my mind, I wasn't good enough. Okay. Now I got to go prove myself again. You know what I mean? And I switched agents after that season. Um, I got a new agent. And, and and from there, man, we've just been been moving forward. And thankfully, um, we've been progressing, you know, in some aspect every year. Um, and, you know, it's definitely, that's a blessing. Uh, so that actually is another thing that kind of comes up frequently that hopefully uh, longtime listeners will, will know that that's certainly not an uncommon thing. But, if, you know, this is the first podcast of ours you've listened to. Uh, switching agents is uh, you talked about earlier about the importance of getting a first agent, but also changing agents is, is not uncommon. So um, you go to France the next year, uh, top mm -hmm. league there. And that's actually where we're going to spend the next two seasons, two different clubs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, take us through before you get to France and how you wind up getting to France, what the decision was like to switch agents at that point in time. Uh, by now, you probably had had some conversations with some other guys being like, yeah, that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Find somebody who's good for you. So first, before you get to France, what was the decision like for you at that point in time to move on and to find somebody else? Um, that Israel Germany season, when I said about being, being a professional, it, it, it taught me professionally how much situation matters. Okay. Um, and so that was one of the main reasons, uh, that I decided to switch my agent, switch my representation. Um, the guy I signed with, you know, again, forgive me, I back just a, a lot went on. Um, but the guy I signed with, I'm, I'm green. I don't know anything about picking the agent. So I'm just in my mind, okay, who is a guy that I can have a beer with that I can feel like I can have some type of trust with and we can build a long-term relationship. Um, and that was my guy. Um, and I chose him and, and, and again, if he listens, I hope he doesn't take this as uh, some disrespect or negative. I'm just telling my story. Um, you know, he was, I was his first ever client. He was a part of a, part of a big agency, but I was his first ever client that he had solely to himself. My mind coming out of college, not knowing anything, not knowing the business is like, oh, that's perfect. He's young, I'm young, we're gonna grind this thing out together. Um, he's gonna work hard, I'm gonna work hard. You know, he only has me to worry about. Years later, professional me realizes maybe that wasn't the best decision um, because he has to make all his mistakes through me. He's learning. You know what I mean? And he's become a, an incredible agent. He's a great guy. Um, but he was learning through me as I was learning through him. So the first two years um, of my, the few years of my career were kind of, um, you know, trial and error for him. Not really, but if you, if you get what I'm trying to say. Um, and after how the Israel situation handled, I just really wasn't uh, happy with how things were going. And then I played pretty well um, uh, in Germany. I had a couple big games against some big teams. And uh, so I'm like, okay, like I just need somebody to give me an opportunity. But I just didn't feel like um, my agent at that time was capable of meeting what I uh, needed. Um, I just felt like we kind of grew apart. Um, and it was tough. Yeah, it was tough for me. Another thing for me, I'm, a, I'm one of those loyal guys is I wanted, I thought my agent would be my agent all my life. You know what I mean? And so that was another thing that was tough for me. It was like, okay, you have to, it hurts. It's, it's tough, but it's my career. You know, I have to do what I think is best for my career. And, you know, that's what I did. And it was the best decision. And right away, um, you know, I, I leveled up in a way, you know, um, financially, competition wise. You know, the French League is a, is a great league to be a part of. And, you know, it was a place where low-level team, very low-level team. I think that year they just came up from the second division. But it was a place that was just – they just wanted me to kind of – I was going to be able to showcase myself. So um, it was perfect. And so I took that one in. No that's questions. That's a really good point. So uh, for one of the teams making the jump, I mean, we, as we talked before with your stint in Italy – uh, you know, being a second division team is not necessarily, you know, any indication that the, the talent level in second divisions in some of these countries are very quite high. Uh, but with this one, you know, where you're looking to find a good fit and you do go to a team that's making the transition to the it's to the first league in France. Take us through not only what that was like, but also in terms of how France in year one for you was, uh, you know, off the court and on the court. France was uh France was cool, man, because it was like uh, I was on one of those lower level teams. So every guy we had a a point, my point guard, he had just came up from the second. It was his first opportunity in the first league. Um, you know, I had a, a, a four man who was my guy. He played at Nebraska, uh, Brandon Ubel, but he was a uh, he had come from Belgium. You had myself. We had a, um, we were just like even the 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 French guys. A lot of them were just still under contract. They were the second division guys, but they were under contract. So it was just like a a real underdog, scrappy team that was. It was just perfect, you know. what I mean, we um, we weren't that good, but you had to beat us every time. But being those type of teams, we we were close. You know, uh, we were, we were very close. I I went almost every night. I was with 
one of my teammates, whether we were just at their home drinking wine, maybe, I don't know, we're playing PlayStation, watching EuroLeague, something. You know, a lot of times I was always with uh, at least one of my teammates. Um, and when you have relationships like that, you know, just like any any business, anything in the world, it it benefits your own the court game because you trust each other. You allow each other. You know what he likes. You know, if OK, if Carvel is saying some crazy things, I know he's just hot. Let him do his thing. And, you know, we'll come back at it later or whatever. But you have that. And um, we had that in, in, in France. It was. It was a tough season. It was the first time for me. Uh, damn, having this conversation with you, I'm thinking about. This is another point where now you're playing to be safe. Um, it, well, I don't even, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, and a lot of times these games were in France, so maybe we go play Monaco. It's like, okay, guys, go have fun. We might not scout that much that week. We're a, a bottom team. Um, and then, but it's like, like no, I, in my mind, I thought we were trying to make the playoffs. You know, it's like even the player, there's just a mindset you play with. You don't play to like, okay, let's just not be the last two teams. Um, so I'm just like dealing with all that. It was, um, it was a lot that year. But again, I've always, um, every season has given me something. And that was another one that, that, that taught me. And, you know, then being pressured to have to perform every night now. Um, okay, yes, second division, there's two Americans. So you have to perform, but okay, now we're in the first league. You know, it's it's different. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on, there's a lot more pressure. So um, you know, it helped me to kind of cultivate the the player I am now. Thanks to SeatGeek for sponsoring Expat Hoops. We recently became a brand ambassador for them. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets. They offer a zero to 10 score on each ticket to know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green means good, red means bad. You get the idea. It's a really easy way to get tickets to events. Plus, our viewers get $20 off their first ticket purchase with the Expat Hoops code. Click the link in the description to download the app. Remember the code Expat Hoops, E X P A T H O O P S, all one word, to save yourself $20 off your first ticket purchase with SeatGeek. In our house, when we use a VPN, we are sure to use NordVPN. NordVPN secures up to six devices and is compatible with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even your Wi-Fi router. Plus, it's no risk to your wallet. Head over to their website for pricing or contact customer support 24-7. And remember, your purchase is always safe with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description to use our code and make sure you're secure with Nord VPN. With that particular instance, did you feel pressure from the team? Uh, or I would even say maybe even the fans. Uh, I Like you were saying, this is a team that was, was in the second division. I, I think it probably be, maybe would be a little bit different if you were a team that historically was in the top division that was in danger yeah. of, of going down. But what were if any, what were their, uh, you know, pressures from, you know, management or the fans, or was it just something that was a little bit more self-imposed where you're like, I don't want to fall down another division or all of it. Yeah. It's a little bit of, uh, so another thing, another goal for most players is to never have to face relegation. You know what I mean? That's something that you uh, all, I, I would assume all players just mentally, spiritually have within themselves. Um, so that's that's that was tough for me. Um, that was tough for me that winning one every game when you're in that situation is a championship. Every game you win, you celebrate. It's like okay, you know, because a lot of times teams, um, you have a number. Uh, it was when I was uh, when I was in Turkey. You have a number. Okay, we need to get eleven wins. Historically, eleven wins keeps you safe. I don't know how to think like that. You know, I'm saying? I don't know how to get like that. So for me, it was more of within myself. And like I said, I'm in a point where I'm trying to prove myself. I don't want to be, I, I, didn't, I don't want to be a, a second year player. I mean, excuse me, a, a second division player. And there's no disrespect. There's great players in that league. But just how to get division, I wanted to be a division one basketball player. So I'm not going division two, division three, and I, no, I'm going to go three JUCOs and I'll see you guys in division one but I'm going to get in division one. And that's just how I felt. And it was the same way about being in the first league. I'm like, 
I'm playing well in the second division. You know, you work out with a lot of these top league guys all the time. You're around them. You know a bunch of them. Um, I'm not saying I am at maybe their level or whatever, but I know that I can compete with them any get any day, and I've proven it. So I didn't want to settle for that. Being on the team that I was facing relegation, you're one of those fringe French play, uh, fence players. Like, okay, he's a great second division player. You know, he's kind of like a uh, guy you can come maybe keep you safe in the second division, in the first division. And I didn't want to be that. Um, I didn't want to be that. So I had that fire inside of myself. You know, I want to play Euro League. You know, that's what everybody wants. You want to play Euro Cup, Euro League. You want to do all of that. So I don't want to do that. And um, so it was tough for me personally where we lose to, I don't know, Asheville by, by 25 or something. I can't sleep they didn't even expect to win anyway. They are seeing the city and stuff or whatever. They, you know what I mean? It's like, that was just a game to play because we have to play it. Um, there was no thought in their mind to actually win that game. But for a lot of athletes, the players, especially I'm speaking for American guys, we don't know how to do that. Um, so that was tough for me. That was very tough for me. It was the first time I had to deal with that. So your next season, you're still back in the top, uh, level of France uh, LMB Pro A. Uh, this time with Gravelines, one that's uh, usually you know in the top league in there for a while. So, what was the difference like going from the team that you were with in the first season to a team that's a little bit more established? It was awesome, man. It was probably the most, other than last year. Last year was amazing. It was the most fun I'd had in my career because. Uh, one of my close friends, Taylor Smith, had played and gra- he was playing in Gravelines the year I was in Bullizac. <clears throat> and, you know, they called me in the summer. He's like, yeah, man, the coach still was asking about you. Like, what you trying to do? We always say we could play. He played in Ravenna in A2 when I was there. We pl- both played two years together in A2. Well, not together. We both were in A2 for two years playing against each other. Ravenna was 20 minutes from me, so we would always hook up and then go to Bologna or whatever. But we were together. Um, and he's called like, man, like, it'd be cool. It'd be fun to do that. I'm like, it would. And Gravelines, as you said, they're, they're, they're a, a very strong, historically, like, mid-level team in the French League, um, a playoff contending team, um, a very, one of the more professional teams I've ever encountered in my entire career. Um, like, they're incredible, the, the way that they do business. And, for me, I looked at it as leveling up. Okay, not where I want to be at yet, but it was an A2. We don't talk about Israel. I went to BBL. I went to Germany. Okay, I did it there. Wasn't what I needed. That's okay. Got to France. Second to last team in France. That's all right. I'm still in France, but I leveled up. Now I'm, I'm at a, I don't know, a, eight, a six to eight level team in France. That was my mindset. I'm still progressing. I'm climbing the ladder, and that's what got me going, okay? Now, now I got to make the playoffs. And, and that was our goal going there. And unfortunately, we didn't get to. We had uh, – and then that summer, okay, it was like, all right, we signed Edgar Sosa. It's tough. Point guard from Louisville, New York. We signed Scott Wood, uh, shooter from uh, – where Scott play? Uh, North Carolina State. Um, you know, we got my man Taylor. We just got a nice team. And um, it just seemed perfect. Injuries kind of held us back a little bit. Um, but I'm like, okay, I was, it, was, it wasn't about relegation. It's like, like we're trying to make the playoffs. You know, we're not trying to lose any game. It doesn't matter if it's Monaco, if it's As. It doesn't matter who it is. Like, we're playing them to beat them. Um, so, you know, so now that's more of my speed. And, and that was the first time I was a part of an organization that was – they had a winning culture. Um, my second year in Italy, we were picked to, to finish um, second to last. And we finished top four in the league. So we won, but there was no expectations and there was no culture of winning. The fact that we finished fourth was like they just won the Euro League championship. Um, there was no every game, there was no expectations of in, in uh Gravelines, there was expectations. Um and and I was able to we had a great season. I played well. I uh I'm not sure if I still have it. I hope I still have it. Let's hope I still have it. Um I broke the record in France for the most threes in the game. Um, I broke that in, in front. Uh, I have, I think I'm first and second or first and third in France for most threes in the game. I don't know, but I'm somewhere in there. 
Um, you know, so and, and that got me uh, the opportunity to go to Spain and play in the ACB. Which is another fantastic league to be in. So, mm-hmm. we were, again, mm-hmm. you're talking about leveling up. That's, that's something that consistently comes up. So, uh, again, leveling up here. Go to Spain. Mm-hmm. This is probably also going to be your COVID year. Uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, Spain is usually I, I have not heard a bad word about Spain. Uh, so what was your year in Spain like? Um, first off, Spain is a beautiful country. Oh, man. Like seeing Spain, I, Spain and Italy, everybody know the like cousins, language, culture, everything. But I don't know. The sun in Spain is different than than it is everywhere else in the world. <laughs> it is so beautiful in Spain. And so I was excited because it was a uh, um, it was another one of those countries like Italy was one of those countries. If you're American, you know, hey, I want to go see Italy. I want to go to Greece. I want to go to Spain. Um, a lot of times Germany is not really one of those, but Spain was like, I get to go live here. And we were in Madrid. We were like a suburb of Madrid. So it's the first city, the real city I'm getting to be a part of. Um, so I, for me, it was awesome. I was so excited. Um, and I had a good situation there. Uh, another thing, it's the first time we're now we're talking um, the rules in different leagues, how how styles adjust, how you, how you adapt. Um, you only have two Americans in this top league. They really want to keep this, this, this style of play. And then you see how good they actually are. It's the first time when I had um, – the French players were, were really good, but they were the veterans. You know, a lot of times the young guys, the ones – your backup never really um, was a threat to take your spot. Good player, solid player. You know, the, the star French and Italians, they were uh, incredible players. Um, but a lot of times as a young guy, maybe an Esquire, maybe a 19-year-old guy or something like that, they're, they're, he's a project. In Spain, everybody can go. In Spain, <laughs> man, in Spain, like, like you're, you, me, I would, be, I would be surprised if I was starting game to game. We switched it up a lot. Because my backup, Mark, was a snipe shooter, a, a, a sharp shooter. Like, it was tough. And then it's like, okay, I'm in this league and there's, we're playing – 35, 37, 38 year old men who just destroy you and they can't jump over a sheet of paper, some of them. <laughs> and he just, you can't do anything with them. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on? Like the, the, the way they were thinking, I wasn't, uh, I was just playing basketball, you know, my career prior to that, doing what I do best. This is like, no, okay, you have more skill than him. You can, it doesn't matter. His, his, the, the the knowledge he has of the game is just they embarrass you sometimes um so I got to learn a lot there I learned so much in Spain um you know the way that um I want to give this gym out uh the way that I control end of the game uh situations the I'm a Kobe guy right I'm a person that sorry teammates they all know me I love y'all uh, if there's a few seconds on the, on the, in the left in the game to win the game and I have the ball nine times out of 10, I'm probably not passing that for that game winning shot. Like I really um, take pride in that moment. Zero for 20, I'm taking that game winner. Um, but how to control that situation, I learned in Spain. My coach taught me. Um, I had a shot one time at the half at the halftime buzzer uh, at the halftime and I left too much time on the clock. Cause I don't remember what the time was, but I'm handing him, handing him. Okay, I go, I score, make a tough basket, but maybe there's six, seven seconds left on the clock. The other team call a timeout, they get a second go. They don't score, but he's talking to me. He was, he was a smart individual. He didn't get to finish the season with us, but um, you know, he's talking to me situation. He's like, okay, and he told me this, and I keep it now. It just helped me win my championship this year. Actually, whatever time is on the clock. That's how many dribbles you have, okay? So, um, so just like my my, I had a game winner this year, um, in in the championship in Italy. We had three point six seconds left. So he taught me three seconds left. You have two shots and you have two dribbles and a shot. So you don't have to think about anything. You know what you got to do. So whatever the time you have, five seconds, you have four dribbles and a shot. You know what I mean? If you, if you, whatever it is, you can use three dribbles, a shot, faking a shot, but that's how you can control your time to where you don't have to watch the time or know the time, you know, already 
I have these moves. When I do this move, this is where the clock at. Um, so just little stuff like that I, I learned and it was just like stuff I never thought of. And um, I take that with me, but that was, uh, that was the mental. Now the physical and the mental are meeting um, in Spain. Which that's actually kind of, I mean, first of all, I was completely interested by that. Uh, as somebody who played, trust me, not at anywhere near the level that you played, but it's yeah. interesting to me that, that that's sort of like one of those things where you're like, that's actually a really good point. And it also yeah. is really something too, because again, all the stuff that you've done played so many levels above me, uh, you know, college, division one, you know, different countries, you know, this is what, year five-ish or so that you're, you're learning. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. that's kind of interesting. And it also kind of speaks a little bit to what you're saying about how things are in the Spanish league, where there mm. are still things that like you're saying about these guys that I really liked when yeah. you said, couldn't jump over yeah. a piece of paper. They're being because, <laughs> because their mental side of it, they're, yeah. there's been some thought to it. So that's actually kind of really interesting to me. So, um, but this is also the COVID year uh, where mm -hmm. COVID breaks out. Any particular COVID story, everybody seems to have them. Well, it, for me, it sucked because I got injured early and I missed like that, um, that Octo end of October through the beginning of November period recovering. So I come back and I am rolling. I'll be honest with you, I'm rolling. Like I have my, like, you know, you got to prove yourself after injury. Now they're like, okay, do we need a medical guy? I'm in, I'm in uh, ACB now. So now I'm like, I have to secure myself and show that I'm here, you know, I played through injury. I got a game winning block uh, with a torn, uh, with like four, I forgot what it was, but I tore my hamstring uh, during the game and I still went and got the game winning block. Um, but like, I'm just like Iron Man, whatever it is, I'm going. But now my games, I'm hitting shots, I'm rolling, we're beating uh, Juventus, Badalona, we beat, uh, we beat Barca, we beat uh, Zaragoza out there. Uh, we beat, like, we were rolling. Um, we beat Gran Canaria, and then the league shuts down. We had switched coaches, excuse me. When I, during my injury, we switched coaches, um, and the new coach was a, um, a second division coach. So his style was very American, feed the Americans. So I was able to get a little more freedom, kind of more of my style of play when he arrived. And that's when I started um, um, playing well. And then COVID hit. And we're just like everybody else panicking. You know, we're talking. It's it's like going through Italy now. We're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's crazy. You guys see what happened in Italy? It's like, yeah, but we're worried about the game. And then um, uh, uh, my, my girlfriend is, she goes to bed. So I'm up. I'm watching the, I'm actually watching the NBA presser when Gobert is at the stand and he's talking. The and infamous he's one by it. now. Yep. I'm literally up. It's like, I don't know, two, three in the morning, just laying there. I don't know if we had it. I think we had a game. We might have lost or something. And I don't sleep after a game. I'm up to like 7 a.m. I'm just laying on the couch watching and he's doing that and I'm laughing. It's nothing. And I go to sleep. And the next day we go to practice and. <laughs> Uh, the practice before the meeting is like everybody, okay, everybody wear a mask, back away, okay. The president comes in, is like the Americans, Trump just said you guys have until, it's like Wednesday, Trump said you guys have until Friday to get home, you guys need to get out. Like, it was just like, you know, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we're in a foreign country, all of, all of our family is at home. Um, so you're not really sure what is going on. We don't, you know, now we kind of, you know, we at least understand more of what it is at that time when it happened like that, you don't know. People are, you know, taking all the toilet paper and stuff from the, the grocery stores and stuff. You don't know what the heck is going on. So it's a lot of uncertainty and then it just kind of sucked because I was really starting to find my footing. Um, and it was in the ACB and, and I think I really could have left a better name than what I did while I was there um, had COVID not happened like that. Hmm. So, uh, you know, the last couple of seasons where we're obviously COVID still with us, but, uh, you yeah. know, we spent it in Turkey and, and back in Italy again, uh, take us through the journey to get to Turkey, uh, and what your season was like there. Um, well, you know, that, you know, we're home what, February, March, or maybe early March or whatever, because of COVID. So I'd never been home in March and, I don't know, even I've been to college. So at that time, I don't know, 10 years, I hadn't been home in March. Um, so we're home March to like July. I don't even know, honestly, March, 
April, May, like I honestly in my mind is, is, is having to have a conversation with myself. Like, are we ever going to be able to play basketball over there again? I don't know what's going on. You know, the NBA is trying to figure something out. Like they're not playing. They stopped everything. We're like, you know, what is going on? So it was a, um, that was a real life moment for me. Um, you know, financially, now you're trying to, you know, even more so make sure everything is in order, make sure, okay, I need to do this. Um, and so basketball wise, I had turned down a, I had my mind made up on what kind of what I wanted my next place to be. Um, and I hadn't gotten those offers from a place like that. I got good offers and I turned down actually more uh, money than I ended up taking. Um, but I didn't want to. After being in the ACB, you either want to move laterally or move up uh, or, you know what I mean? Like, you don't want to go back down after experiencing the ACB. And that was my goal. So my agent and myself, we thought basketball wise for my career individually, Turkey could become a, a lateral move for us in hindsight. Um, and so, you know, that's why we ultimately took that decision. And we knew about some of the red flags going into it, but um, we took it knowing what it was and just, you know, just kind of going there on a, a bet on yourself type of year. We have merch. Head over to the Expat Hoop Store where you'll find t-shirts, hoodies, masks, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and more. It's one of many ways you can show support for the podcast, so head over there and pick up some merch. That link below is in the video description, or you can head over to our website, expathoops.com, and click merch. We offer a couple of different Expat Hoops logos, and we have men's, women's, and kids' sizes, so you can get something for everyone. So that does lead you to this last season in Italy, and you mentioned it mm -hmm. earlier, do win a championship. So this is also another period of time where, I mean, you get to go, this is your first time going back to a country uh, after having not been there for a little while. So, right. um, but again, it's, well, actually, that's not true. Uh, well, actually, no, I, I was thinking about France where you, you've kind of got these unique experiences, but you've got yeah. a, a number of years in between um, the two Italian clubs that you've played for. Obviously, the first stop was for two seasons. Um, and so, at least as of the present, this is almost kind of your bookend, the other bookend of it. Um, what was appealing about going to this particular club in Italy? And obviously, you must have chose something, right? Because you guys wind up winning a championship. Man. If I'm honest, and I mean, everybody who needs to know this, know this, I turned down that offer, I think at least three times. I think three times I turned down that offer because, not because of Verona, because, you know, even like I told my general manager speaking last summer, I started in A2 Italy. Verona is, if you're playing in A2 Italy, like I talked about Bullizac to Gravelines, that does it like, it had been like going from Bullizac to, Monaco, you know, in the A2 division, going from being in Verona. Verona is the place. They, you know, the facility, it's the city, the people, they have the money, the culture there. It's a basketball place. It's not a real um, second division organization. Um, so it intrigued me. I'm like, okay, I know, I understand who it is. It's a respected team. It wouldn't have been like going back to where I started. But in my mind, like I said, um, the same thing. I want to. Uh, I either want to move lateral or I want to progress. And for me, this felt like this is the first time it felt like a step back. And um, you know, I, I I had a fear. If I'm honest, I had a fear of um, that same thing I told you going to the first year of France of being. Yeah, he's a second division guy. He was a really really good second division guy. Um, and I had a fear of that. And, you know, even talking with my family and my age and stuff, it's like, I, I it's in a beautiful situation. Like, literally, word for word, what I told my GM when we talked, when I denied um, the original offer is Verona is a place like, if that was in the first, first uh, division and it was my choice, I could see myself spending my career there. You know, I know how they do things. I would be, but the fact that a second division, I, it's a personal pride, ego, whatever you want to call it for me, that it's, it's stopping me. Um, and we ended up talking, working things out. We, we discussed, maneuvered some things. And uh, ultimately, you know, I was speaking, speaking with, uh, with my family, um, speaking with my agent. It's like, okay, 
if I go there, I have to win a championship. I've been a great player there. I have to win a championship. Okay, so now how do I win a championship? And just I don't know if it's God or whatever it is at the time, like um, either right before that or not too long after that, I was listening to a podcast. Um, I was listening to the Earn Your Leisure and they had Shaq on. And Shaq was saying uh, he had had a quote and he was like, I didn't start winning championships. He's like, uh, once I stopped caring about my statistics is when I started winning championships. And I'm like, okay, I'm not a selfish guy. I don't care about whether I score 20 or not or whatever, but that's my game. You know, if I, if something's going wrong in the game for me, a way to solve it is to get a basket. Okay. So my mindset now is I need to win at all costs. If I have zero points, I'm happy about it. I'm going to play the best defense I can possibly play. I'm going to try to get as many rebounds, be the best team. They need me to score 30. I'm going to give you 30. You don't need me to play. I'm not going to play, but I'm going to do whatever it takes to win this game and to win a championship. And that's how I approached it. That's how I approached it from the preseason. When, as soon as I got there talking to the guys, we had a lot of very young team. Um, that's how I went about every day. Um, it was my only thing was that I need to win. We need to win the championship. And, you know, the, the coach was amazing. It's uh, one of the, probably my favorite, not even probably, I think he's my favorite um, overseas coach I've had. Um, we kind of aligned um, uh, ideally with each other from the very beginning, you know, and I just kind of, you know, let him, whatever you need from me, I'm doing. This year, whatever you need from me, I'm doing. I don't care what it is. I am doing it and I'm doing it for the team. And uh, he, he was, he's a coach, he, um, in one of our first meetings, he told the team, and this one I knew was going to be a good year. He told the team, I always try to share this. I had never heard this before from a coach. Um, he told the team, whatever my tone is, my voice, is how I need you guys to respond to me intensity-wise. If I'm chilling, then you guys, I, 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 we're professionals. Do you guys do your job? We can laugh, we can smile, you can do that. If I turn up on you guys, I need you to respond to that accordingly. There's no questions asked. There's no no fighting back and forth. My voice raised. It doesn't happen often, but you understand where I think we need to be. And it might not even be punishment. It's just okay. Maybe this is Tuesday, you know. And we gotta we gotta have a tough one. Um, and I just love that. And he never yelled or anything unnecessarily. And we always throughout the year just followed his voice. So every day going to practice, going to work. It was a pleasure. You know, it never felt like work. Um, everybody was amazing. Like it was, uh, it was, it was, it ended up being the best decision I could have made. Um, and everybody responded from management to president, to coaches, to, to trainers, um, to how I approached it. And we all, every single person wanted the same exact thing. And it was never spoken about. We have never had a conversation with each other, any one of us, about winning a championship until it was an actual possibility. It was just something for some reason that was understood. Um, I'm not sure if it's, you know, because we start winning games and we see, okay, we're, we're pretty good. Or if it was something prior, but, you know, a lot of teams like, okay, we have to win a championship. We have to win a championship. There was a team in the league this year who after every practice, one of my friends played for, I won't name, would huddle up championship on three. Every day, that is the message. We never once had a conversation about it. Hmm. But everybody played and sacrificed um, for that. And uh, a quick one, we, our fourth game of the season, we're, we're uh, our fifth game of the season, we're two and two at this time. We play a game on the road. I make a free throw um, to tie the game up with like, I don't know, four or five seconds left. I shoot the free throw. The other team takes the ball out. They hand it to the point guard. He goes full length of the court without getting touched, scores a layup at the buzzer without getting touched. I go nuts in the locker room. I go crazy emotionally. Like I, I didn't even, I wasn't thinking about anything. You know, I just went crazy and just crazy. And the message of what I told the guys was, you know, I don't care if it, you have to get ejected. You have to throw this guy into the stance. You know, he doesn't go, he gets to go shoot two free throws. He doesn't go past all of us and scores a layup 
after we were down 15 and we fought all the way back. And that was double, it's the overtime when this happens. We just did all that and sacrificed all that to be in this position. And then we allowed that. I'm throwing the table. And I didn't know it at the time. Um, so the coach comes in and he just says, this is when I knew I was like, okay, he comes in and I could get fined for this. I could be, I'm throwing the table. He's like, you need to listen to what Carville said. Like, like there's his message was like, some people, this is how they feed their families. You know, we have some young guys on here who were playing and stuff. This is like how we eat. This is everything. This saves some of our lives. Like we have to have more accountability, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know at the time before the game was over, my general manager went to the locker room to use the restroom. So he overheard me destroying everything and yelling at the guys. And he texted me after and was just like, basically telling me how much he loved what I said and how it was like, that's how we need it. And I just, at that moment, it's just like, you know, I was able to be my true self finally. I didn't have to have to worry about looking over my shoulder for my job, for anything or nothing. And, you know, I was able to be the best version of myself. Well, again, ended in a championship uh, in Italy in one of the nicest mm. places you could possibly be. Mm. Uh, mm. So we have a little bit more for you if you're willing to stick around yeah. and do some extras. No, I'm here. But thank I you so bad. much. I feel bad. I feel like I'm long-winded. No, we like to. Excuse we both me. like to talk, so it's fine. Mm. <laughs> so uh, we'll wrap this up. We'll wrap up the regular pod. If you're listening to this on an audio, uh, hop over to YouTube. We have expat extras, and we have a couple extra things to get into with Carvel. But again, thank you so much for sitting down with us on the regular pod. No, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.